You are listening to Meet the Thriller Author. I am your host, Alan Peterson, and each episode of this podcast will introduce you to a new author in the thriller, mystery, and suspense genres. As a reader, I've been a fan of those uh, type of books for a very long time, and that is why I write in that uh, genre now, and so I'm excited to introduce you to new authors. Discovering uh, new books and authors is uh, such a fun thing to do, and uh, that's what I hope to do with these uh, interviews. So stay tuned for the next episode of Meet the Thriller Author. Hey everybody, this is uh, Alan Peterson with Meet the Thriller Author, and I'm really excited to have uh, best-selling uh, author uh, Wayne Stinnett uh, with me today. Uh, Wayne, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Alan. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks so much uh, for coming on the show, and uh, if for uh, listeners who might not be familiar with uh, who you are, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your books? Uh, I write the uh, Jesse McDermott Caribbean Adventure Series and the uh, Charity Styles Action Caribbean Thriller Series. I uh, started out about oh, three years ago and uh, published my first book in October 2013. And things just snowballed through the early part of 2014. And uh, I quit my job on, in May of 2014. Yeah, that is, a, that, that is incredible, uh, the success you've had with your, with your books. And I was reading in your bio, you actually started writing the Jesse McDermott stories like years, like a decade ago, right? Uh, yeah, in 1987. Oh, I, wow. <laughs> I've got a drawer full of uh, rejection letters to prove it. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice revenge. Uh, your success is the best revenge <laughs> for the rejection letters. <laughs> exactly. Well, what uh, led you to start uh, uh, writing? Uh, have you always written? I've, I've been a storyteller pretty much all my life. As a kid, we'd camp out in the backyard, me and my brothers and cousins and whatever, and friends. And I'd entertain them with stories, just make them, make them up as I go. And... Uh, in 1987, uh, I was working as an estimator for a heating and air conditioning company, and I wrote a computer program that pretty much eliminated my two co-workers' jobs and cut my hours down by about half. And uh, so I was on salary, so they required me to stay there anyway. So during my free time, I just made up stories and used a, a company's computer to write them. Once you found years later when you decided to start to publish, to try to get publishing another try yeah it was uh, it's kind of a weird story uh, my wife was cleaning out uh, a briefcase full of all our old paperwork and stuff and she found my uh, divorce documents from my first marriage and on the back of it I'd handwritten uh, several several uh, chapters of uh, it was a real long divorce document so on the back was several chapters of uh, one of my short stories, and she said that she told me it was pretty good, and I should try it again. So I started digging around, and finally, after about a month cleaning out the garage, I'm kind of a pack rat. I came across the old original five and a half inch floppy disks with the stories on them, and uh, it took me a, quite a while to find a computer that had a floppy disk drive. Uh, did that sound come over yours? Uh, no, uh-uh. no, oh, okay. that's good. That was my cash register ringing on book report. Oh, that's a good, that's a good sound. <laughs> <laughs> I like the sound of that. <laughs> but uh, I, I took the, the best three that I'd submitted to several agents and publishers back in the 80s and sort of compiled them into two novels and just elaborated and expanded on the storyline. And uh, The first book didn't do anything at all, like all first books never do. But uh, when I pus- published the second book, all of a sudden, in the last two weeks of 2013, the first book sold over 100. And so I said, well, maybe I can uh, make a little extra change doing this. So I just kept writing. And uh, I wrote my third book and released it in April of 2014. And uh, it took off really big. And then the, before I even finished the fourth book, I knew I could make a living. And uh, I quit my job two weeks before the fourth book was published. Wow, that's incredible. And you kind of start, I mean, you, yours, it, the success, the, they started selling basically kind of on their own, right? If I re- recall correctly, you didn't really like, there wasn't like a big promotional push or anything like that. It was like word of mouth. I didn't even know what promotion was. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a whole lot in uh, K-boards. Yeah. 
and that was I joined K Boards in uh, I think about March, February or March or, of 2014, and started learning. Just I mean, there's so much information that you know what I'm talking about. It's just you, you can get a four year degree in self publishing in just a few months of reading. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I learned what learned. I didn't even know that I had all these opportunities available. I joined Select, so I moved all my books to Select and did a couple of small promos and then got accepted for a BookBub promo. And it was just phenomenal. It was out of this world. 1,600 books sold in one day. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. And then before you uh, before you quit your day job, uh, I mean, you were uh, you were driving a, a truck. Were you ride Were you riding while you were uh, driving around the country, or? Well, not at the same time, yeah. but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be kind of dangerous. I, I hauled oversized loads, and oversized loads could only be moved during daylight hours. And in the winter time, you know, that's only about eight hours out of the day that I was able to drive. And so during the other sixteen hours, uh, I. I was parked in a truck stop somewhere, and I only sleep about five hours a day, so I had a whole lot of free time, and that's where I did the bulk of my writing uh, for the second the second two books. And do you write like um, uh, with a laptop, and do you use like a, on, on Word document, or do you do you use like a writing program? Yeah, just on my laptop with Microsoft Word. I still use Microsoft Word today. Uh, Everybody talks about all the advantages of a, a Scrivener and all these other uh, programs, but I'm I'm real old. <laughs> I can't learn. I can't. I can only learn so much. If I learn anything more, I'm gonna have to forget something. <laughs> I just I, I leave that the technology stuff. I leave that up to others. I, I just write it in Microsoft Word with just you know regular, just a regular Word document and. My formatter puts it together in a in a Mobi and a PDF and for paperback and uh, ebook. Yeah, I just I don't even worry about that. That's I could probably learn it, but it would take time away from writing, and that's that's what makes the money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you've been uh, you're so generous on the keyboards, which is uh, for the listeners that don't know, it's a writing. Uh, it's, it's well, it's not a writers uh, forum. It's uh, for Kindle fans, but there's a writers there's a section for writers, and that's like uh, where I've Dig- digitally met uh, Wayne on this this forum, and you've always been so generous with your time. And I actually, uh, you had recommended a uh, your proofreader Donna, and I actually she proof proof uh, proofread uh, my second book. So thank you for that. <laughs> oh, Donna Donna is great, yeah. Su- super lady, really really fast, and uh, she does a little bit more than just proofreading. It's more like line yeah. editing almost. Yeah, exactly. I was gonna say that. Yeah, to say proofreading. Uh, yeah, because she really puts some insights and like says, well, maybe you should try this. I'm like, oh, this is like beyond proofreading. <laughs> yeah, she does a great job, and the turnaround is. Uh, I sent her my last book uh, Friday. Yeah, Friday night, and uh, she sent it back to me Saturday afternoon. Wow. Yeah, this is awesome. And do you uh, do you write every day? I, I try to. Uh, sometimes I take the weekends off, and uh, we go out on the boat and go fishing, or just go out to the beach and look for seashells. And why did you start writing thrillers? Were you a fan of uh, an action and adventure uh, uh, stories? Are you were you a fan of the of that genre? That's what I started reading. At, well, back when I was just like a little kid, ten years old, the Hardy Boys mysteries. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, then I found, oh, back in the 70s, I guess, I found John D. McDonald mm-hmm. and uh, his Travis McGee series. Uh, when I got my driver's license, I drove all the way down to Fort Lauderdale from Melbourne, Florida, and went to the Bahiamar uh, Marina looking for slip F-18. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to meet Travis McGee. <laughs> I was kind of disappointed. There's no Travis McGee and there's no Slip F18. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's pretty much all I read. Mostly uh, South Florida-based uh, action adventure writers and thriller writers. Uh, I read some Lee Child, his uh, Jack Reacher series. My main character's got a little bit of Jack Jack in him. But uh, it's the genre that I've always read, so it's just natural that that would be what I write. And uh, it it works out really well. Yeah, and you're very, very uh, uh, 
uh, focus with your books on the, um, uh, different themes, especially when you first started publishing them. I, I hadn't really see, uh, read books before on um, like the keys and with the uh, sailing uh, backdrop to it. Um, so was that just combining like a, a lot of your interests, right, in real life, and you kind of just that's why you started writing about the action and sailing and all that. Well, I, I grew up in Melbourne, Florida, and I uh, lived for a while in, in Marathon down in the Florida Keys. So I lived on a 42-foot uh, Alden-designed cutter sloop anchored in Boot Key Harbor. I had my total expenses was $25 a month for a mooring ball, and that gave me a shower once a day at the marina and uh, a mailbox. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Expenses were very low. I drove a cab at night and worked as a dive master during the day. And I've worked on several charter boats and fishing boats and uh, worked in Cozumel, Mexico for a while as a dive master. So it was just natural that since I read mostly South Florida writers, uh, Randy Wayne White and his Doc Ford series, and Doc Ford's a marine biologist and he sat on the water all the time and lives in a stilt house. So it was just natural for my main character to also live in a stilt house and in down in the Keys and works as a, a charter boat captain. Yeah, you really struck a chord with the readers because I had never um, seen uh, stories like those. I think Amazon categories like sea adventures. Uh, yeah, I hadn't even know that existed till you, you came around. But you really have owned that uh, category uh, the last couple of years. <laughs> Well, the, the true sea adventures are more of a, a swashbuckling type book, you know, back in the pirate days. And uh, but there's no reason why it can't be modernized. And the the boats instead of big sailing vessels can be high speed power boats. And uh, the main characters instead of being pirates, they could be, uh, you know, modern day. Uh, reluctant heroes is your personality make it into your books uh, like with jesse mcdearman i know you're you're also in the marines and he's a former marine do you find a lot of uh, your personality in, in that character yeah uh jesse is me morally uh, but physically you know i'm a lot better looking than <laughs> <laughs> uh, jesse's six foot three i'm five nine and he's got all his hair and he's built and buff and runs every day and swims every day and i just sit in my recliner and write <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah the yes living uh, was that vicariously through uh jesse mcdermott's adventures <laughs> but yeah he's a he's a retired marine gunnery sergeant and in the in the short stories he was just a four-year marine he got out after his first tour like i did and uh he served in you know he's he's one of those high speed low drag kind of marines he he was a a sniper instructor he was in infantry for 20 years. I was in motor transport. We might not be the pride, but without us, the pride don't ride. <laughs> Here you go, yep. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, <clears throat> he's uh, he makes his living on the water. Well, he doesn't really have to make a living. He's, he's independently wealthy from an inheritance. But uh, he's pretty much the same person that I am. He has the same views on life and the uh, same moral compass that I do. Uh, just he's able to enjoy life a little bit, a little bit better. And what inspired you to write your first book uh, uh, back in the uh, '80s? I, I went went to the Keys for the first time in well oh, back in the mid '70s as a young man. I fell in love with the place, and a lot of the books that I read were set and based there in the Keys. And so I just wanted to write about. A guy that got out of the Marine Corps and moved to the Keys and took care of whatever came up. And where do you get uh, your ideas for your books? Uh, well, for the characters, a lot of the characters are based on people that I've met over the years. I'm, I'm 57 years old, so I've met a lot of people. And uh, the scenery, the, the settings for the books are places that I've been, for the most part. Uh, I haven't been to... Well, I've been to Cuba, to Guantanamo Bay, but I haven't visited Cuba like Jesse did, sneaking in under cover of darkness in scuba. But uh, most of the places he goes are places that I've been to. And I, I don't really do any plotting. I just pick a destination, some place that I think my, my readers might enjoy learning about. And then I tell Jesse, and I say, Jesse, go to uh, Cozumel, Mexico. Well, he ended up in Cuba. <laughs> He drives the boat. I, I just follow along. Yeah, you, yeah, you take notes for what he says. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
And now you've uh, you have a new series now. She was one of the characters in one of the your books, if I recall, right? You spun her off uh, into her own series. Yeah, Charity Styles is a uh, she's a former Olympic swimmer, and she joined the army uh, right after nine eleven. Became a helicopter pilot, and after the army, she worked for the Miami Dade Police Department and was recruited by Department of Homeland Security for the Caribbean Counterterrorism Command. It's a group of individuals that are based in South Florida, uh, and they work to prevent uh, terrorist threats there and uh, terrorists coming into the country. But uh, in the fifth, no, the sixth book, she's offered an opportunity to make a bigger difference, and uh, she takes off on her own and becomes a, a government assassin. And do you find it... Um is there a difference when you're writing for uh, a male versus a, the female character? Oh God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Were you a little nervous it's, about that in the beginning, or? <laughs> yeah, it, the first book was really, really difficult, and the second one really was not a whole lot easier. But I'm kind of getting into her persona now, and uh, it, it, it's becoming easier. But it's still, I, I can't get inside her head like I can with Jesse because, you know, she's a woman. She thinks and feels things that men don't. Mm -hmm. And where do you usually write? Do you have like a, like an office, like a special area you usually write or you write all over the place? Uh, well, starting out, it was in the truck mostly. But uh, in our old house, uh, we had a, a third bedroom that I converted into an office, and it was really crowded. It was just a collect-all room and just had a, a desk and a chair. But I, I never really used the desk very much. I, I sat in the recliner and worked. And now I'm in a new house, and I've got a big, luxurious 20 by 20 office with uh, two desks, uh, a table, conference table. I even have my own bar. Mm, nice. Oh, yeah. And uh, private bathroom, so I don't have to. I can close the door, and when the door is closed, nobody bothers me, and I can write to my heart's content. But I'm still in the recliner. I, right now, I'm in a big leather recliner, and my dog's sitting next to me. And we, I read, I read dialogue to her, and she looks at me, and I can tell by her face whether it's good or not. She's <laughs> like a beta reader, a beta, a beta listener. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that does that does help when you're writing dialogue. Just read it out loud. If reading dialogue out loud, it totally changes the way it sounds in your mind. And you you can write it and you not understand how it's, how it's supposed to be, but until you read it out loud, it uh, takes on a whole different connotation, whole, whole new meaning. Yeah, because you try to go for like the the like a natural like a like a real life conversation. That's what I found that with your books that you're. You know, when they're when when characters are communicating with each other, it's kind of like you know, it's like you're there versus oh, you could, it's not choppy or, or anything like oh, that. Oh, you, you should hear the audio books. My yeah. narrator does a fantastic job of personalizing each individual character, and it, that makes that makes all the world a difference. Now I, when I write Rusty Thurman's part, when I write his dialogue, I hear Rusty's voice. Before, I just, you know, I heard the words in my head, but now I hear his voice because my narrator is just brought into life. And do you have uh, audiobook versions for all your books? Yeah, even the uh, nonfiction. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, I, I haven't read that, your book yet, but I have it. The, uh, was it the, uh, from Blue Collar to No Collar? Yeah. Uh, was that just, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that book? Uh, it was, several people have been, have bugged me to do that, and uh it's just more of a, I wrote it as if I was sitting in a bar, having a beer with a buddy and telling him how I did things and what he should look out for if he wanted to follow this career. And it's, it's a real short read. It's only, uh, I think, 20,000 words, 25,000 words. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's found an audience. It, it, a lot of people have really enjoyed it. And gotten some motivation from it. Yeah, you probably got the. Uh, you probably were getting a lot of questions too about how you did it, and uh, so yeah, it's kind of good to just put it out in a book form and for everybody. 
Well, it's it's not so much a how to. Uh, there there are some tips in it and some you know pitfalls to watch out for, but it's more of a motivational read. Mm-hmm. Uh, I describe you know how to create a, a business plan, how to how to set a goal and achieve it by setting smaller goals to reach it. And it's a psychological thing when you when you meet a small goal. I mean, it could be a very small, simple goal, but when you reach it. You say, "Oh wow, I can do this," and then you you got that next goal, and you you look at your plan and say, "Okay, now I have to do this, and I have to do this to get to this next goal," and you just start building up. And each success builds uh, motivation, it builds uh, self confidence. But without without having a plan and a goal, it's really difficult to to get ahead. Yeah, well, I'm definitely gonna have to move that up to my Kindle read because yeah, that's something that I struggle with. You know, you, I thought, oh, once I got the first book done, you know, it'll it'll get easier, and actually, it didn't. <laughs> so yeah, no, get, no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> like right. I said, it's it's a real short read. You can read it in an hour, hour and a half. Writing more nonfiction? Are you are you going back to your to the to Jesse uh, and and Charity? For now, I'm sticking with the the fiction. Yeah. Uh, I, I may I may release another nonfiction sometime later, but uh, it's not really it's not really what I am, what I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris Fox has had great success with with his series, his nonfiction series. Mm-hmm. I've read I've read all four of those, and it's those are some really really informative, how to hands on approaches to to self publishing and writing, but. Uh, I just like writing. I like writing the stories, telling the stories. And when you're writing, do you write? If you're writing a, a Jesse McDermott book, do you write that to your finish, or do you like go back and forth between Jesse and Charity now? Or well, originally, I, I was doing just one at a time, and then uh, uh, after after I published the first Charity book, I started the next Jesse book, and about halfway through that, I had a, an idea for the next Charity book, so I, I just wrote a couple of paragraphs and put down some ideas in, in the notes section. And before long, I was alternating between the two. I'd write, I'd write until I got burnt out on one, and then I'd just switch over to the other. And it's a fresh story, and I can jump right into it and, and just pick it up right from there. But uh, now I'm, uh, I just, just finished uh, Ruthless Charity, the second book, and I'm working on, uh, I've been working on Fallen Hero, right along with it but now I've turned my full attention to that and I'll probably start slowly developing the next uh, charity book as I go also so yeah two at a time and how many books do you have now in the Jesse McDermott series um, I'm working on the 10th one it's about 20% complete with the first draft okay. and the charity the charity styles book the second one is about to be released and uh, the nonfiction. so 12, 12 out right now, and thirteen, the 13th one coming. Three years now? Four years since you've published the first one? I started writing seriously in June of 2013, so just, just past three years. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, that's a great... It started out just as a hobby, just to you know kill, kill time on the road. And then I realized, wow, I can make some money at this. Maybe I could outfit a woodworking shop and start building... I love building stuff. I, I, my dad was a carpenter, and I always wanted to build boats. So I, I thought, well, I can I could build canoes and kayaks and small sailboats, and maybe get off the road. And uh, all of a sudden, my income from those first three or four books were more than I was making as a truck driver. And I said, well, maybe I can just do this full time. <laughs> So now I've got a big shop out in the backyard, but uh, I still don't have the woodworking tools. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what, the, what? So what keeps you writing? What uh, what motivates you to keep going? I, I just like telling the stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, so long as people are interested and they want to they want to listen to the stories or and read the stories, then I'll keep writing. I have I have no no plans to end either series anytime soon. Oh, that's awesome. How many books are you uh, planning to publish next year? Next year, two. Two. Um, I'm cutting back. Uh, I had been doing three and four a year, but now I'm going to cut back. I'm, I've, I'm taking weekends off. I'm going to take all of uh, December off, 
And uh, next summer, I plan to take at least two months off and do some traveling with uh, my wife and youngest daughter. Oh, that's great. And and how? What is your writing process like? Like when you're uh, when you're in the zone when you're writing? Do you just like um, you know like do you like sit down and do you write all day or how does that usually work for you? Uh, I usually start with editing. Uh, I have a, a way of self editing. At the end of every day, I'll write the word count right at, right at the end of where I stop writing. I just type in the word count, and then I'll make that a style heading, and it appears over in the table of contents. And after after three days, I'll have three numbers mixed in with the chapters in the table of contents. So when I start the next day, I go to, go to that first number, delete it, start reading as I go along and editing as I go. And when I get to the where I ended the day before, I just pick up the story and continue writing. It helps me get my head back into the story. And at the same time, when I finish the book, I've had two pass-throughs editing. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Because usually, yeah, usually everybody else is like, oh, no, write, write all the way through. So it's kind of refreshing to hear that you actually edit as you write. It, it really helps get your head back into it. And you pick up little details that you wrote two days ago and forgot about. And so if you just write straight through, you're going to have a lot of hanging details. But doing that, you, you eliminate a few of them. Yeah, yeah, that's what happened. To, yeah, that's happened to me when I'm done and I go back to read it. And, uh, yeah, you're right. Exactly, that's what happens. It's like, oh, I forgot about this, or I mentioned this here, and then I never went back to it. And now I got to go back to it. <laughs> well, that's why. That's why most writers hate editing. Yeah, <laughs> because when they finish the book, and then they go back and start editing, and they find all these little dangling details and plot points that go nowhere and just end. And you have to rework everything and get it back into the flow. But if you do it as you go, and it only takes an hour or two to re- read and edit the last two days' work, is basically what I do. And by doing it that way, you you don't eliminate all of them, but you eliminate a good bit. And do you have like a, a daily uh, word count? I've always attempted to write a thousand words a day um, after. I, I never really set that as a goal, but after I published my third book, I started keeping a spreadsheet, and one of the things I kept track of was word count, and then I looked at how long it t- took me to write that, I think it was like 360,000 words. It took a year, 365 days. I think, oh, well, that's 1,000 words a day. So I set that as a goal, and I've been trying to trying to do that ever since. And I've, right now, my average is 864 words per day. Oh wow! Over the last <laughs> yeah, that, over three and a half years. <laughs> oh, that's incredible! Yeah, that, down to the word. Yeah. I mean, I've taken you know a week off here and there, and taken weekends off. And there's some days I just couldn't write because I was too tired. Mm-hmm. But uh, I try to manage at least a thousand words. Now I'm I'm usually good for twelve to fifteen hundred. Some days I'll I'll, I'll get up as high as three thousand. And do you still find uh, time to read, or? Yeah, I, I read about. I want to average about uh, a novel every week to ten days. Oh, okay, and are, they, are you still reading like action and thrillers? And yeah, uh, a whole lot more uh, self-published authors now, uh-huh. and uh, I, I found quite a few that you know, uh, quite a few indies that really tell great stories. Michael Reisig, uh, I started reading his books just about the time I published my first book. And it's it's a strange story. I'm reading his first book, Road Key West. And I get about halfway through the book, and the two main characters meet this Jamaican guy named Rufus. I thought, oh, dear Lord, I've got a Jamaican guy named Rufus in my book, which I just published. (laughs) And uh, so I finished his second book, and... I got an email from him, and I was sitting there staring at my computer screen like, do I open this, or is he going to sue me? Or, And finally I opened it, and he had read my book, obviously, and he told me how much he liked it and gave me a few pointers and didn't mention anything at all about Rufus. And so we got to be real close, and we became real good friends over the, the next couple of years, and we started exchanging unedited manuscripts. 
and the last time we did it was uh, last fall. I sent him a book I just finished. He sent me the next one in his series he just finished, and it wasn't. It was it wasn't even a day later. The next next morning, he called me and said, "You've got, you've got your main character looking for emeralds. That's the same as in mine." And we just chalked it up. He used to live in the Keys at the same time I did, and we probably knew a lot of the same characters, and we may have even bumped elbows in a bar drinking a beer. But uh, he told me one time. He said, "Wayne, there are no original thoughts. Everything that you write is." going to be influenced by all the books that you've read Mm -hmm. so if something happens like that you just chalk it up to you know coincidence he he harbors no ill will about i even asked him if i can make my rufus a little bit more like his rufus his books take place (laughs) in the 70s mine take place in the early 2000s so my rufus is a whole lot older than his but when we when we looked at the timeline of the books they're exactly the same age. You guys should do like a where both Rufus's meet or something, <laughs> a, a collaboration. <laughs> well, we've decided that they're the same guy. Oh, okay. His, yeah, years later. Yeah. His, his Rufus is is a, uh, a a mystic fisherman that's just kind of a drifter guy, and mine is a retired chef and who works at the the Rusty Anchor Bar and Grill in in Marathon, and. He's kind of an odd character, and he, you know, does he goes in, gets into a little mysticism. So that we we just agree that they're they got to be the same person. It's probably somebody we have met in common. Yeah, it's probably a guy sitting in the, the in the keys going, "Hey, that's like me." Yeah, they're talking about <laughs> me. Both these guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And uh, do you do you get uh, a lot of feedback f- um, from the from your readers? Um, is it like more like people like it's the sailing, or do you get a lot of uh, ex like military and marines, or a little bit of both? Yeah, uh, a lot of both. Uh, uh, a lot of feedback from people that have visited the Keys and have lived there. My descriptions are: I, I lived there for quite a while and visited there hundreds of times over the years, and uh, the island that Jesse lives on really exists and it's a place I used to camp and uh, go, go diving in the channel right out in front of the island and uh, a, a lot of people say that the, the scenery that I describe is realistic it brings back memories of when they were in the Keys and uh, the characters of course all, most of my characters are prior military quite a few of them are Marines and there's no chance I no chance I'll get any of that wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, they they enjoy all all facets of it: the boating, the the guns, and uh, I have I have a few guns around the house. Yeah, it's a fun read because yeah, it takes you away. Uh, it's kind of like a travel adventure, and then but there's a lot of action, like yeah. nonstop action, which you... well, they all rank real high in action adventure travel. Also, Amazon has such interesting categories. <laughs> And so you say you're going to continue writing uh, uh, for both Jesse and uh, and Charity, right? You're not uh, for next year. Yeah, um, uh, John D. McDonald, my favorite writer of all time. He wrote 21 books in the Travis McGee series, and he wouldn't. He never had any intention of stopping, but he died. And he was he was just starting his 22nd book in the series when he when he passed away uh, back in the 80s. And uh, I have no intention of stopping until the same thing happens. Now I can travel to the, I can go down to the Keys and the Caribbean and uh, write it off, you know, research. <laughs> even, even better. <laughs> even better. Yeah. All right, well, I'm not going to take uh, too much uh, more of your time. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, tell the uh, our listeners before I let you go? Uh, just keep, just keep trying, just keep staying at it. I mean, I know most, most, a lot of your uh, listeners are going to be writers, and the, the thing that's most important, I think, is to set a goal and create a plan and working towards that goal. And if you don't write it down in, on paper, it's not really a goal. It's just a dream you've got in your head. But as soon as you write it down on paper and you stick it on your refrigerator. And you're reminded of it every single day, and it it makes it a lot easier to to work towards that success, and eventually you will achieve it. 
Yeah, that's great advice, especially because there's so many distractions now um, and so many people saying different things. But the most important part is just keep writing and, and putting good books out, right? Yeah. If you can tell a good story, you can always hire somebody to make it a good book. I, I, yeah. I'm not a real good writer. I, I tell the real good story, but I have good editors and proofreaders and beta readers that turn it into a good book. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Wayne, for uh, being on the show. Uh, it was really nice uh, talking to you. Well, I appreciate the time, Al. All right, and I'll have uh, links to your website. Uh, your website's at waitstinnett.com, uh, right? That's your main yeah. site? Yeah. Okay. Or you can go to gaspars-revenge.com. That's uh, my main character's boat. And oh. that'll take you to the ship store where you can buy Jesse McDermott swag. Oh, cool! I'll have to check that. You actually you have a uh, you have character swag. Cool. Yeah, t-shirts, uh, coffee mugs, um, barbecue aprons, tote bags. Got my own line of coffee now, and that'll be on the on the ship store pretty soon. Oh wow, <laughs> that's awesome! Yeah, it, uh, a coffee distributor contacted me. He read my books, and he noticed that my characters drink a lot of coffee. And he said, "Hey, I'm going to send you some of my coffee. What's your address?" But so he sent me some, and I loved it. And so I. Instead of Jesse was drinking a cup of coffee, Jesse's drinking a cup of La Hacienda La Manita coffee. Oh, that is too cool. <laughs> and now they, now they send me uh, uh, two or three pounds every month. And, uh, so you're like set for coffee now. <laughs> yeah. And they, my characters drink Pusser's rum. And the owner of Pusser's happens to be a, an avid reader also. And when last time I went to the Keys, I, I got several bottles of really good rum for free. Uh, wow. I'm still waiting for the people from Rampage Yachts to send me a 45 foot convertible, but <laughs> there you go. I'm, you I'm not holding my breath. Dream, <laughs> dream big. <laughs> oh, that is too cool. I'm definitely, uh, as as a big coffee drinker, I'm definitely going to order that coffee because uh, now I'm, I'm curious as hell to try it. <laughs> it's, it's called Hacienda La Manita Terrazzo, That's spelled with two R's. And it's grown on a small farm in Costa Rica. The, the farm has its own school. It's got its own hospital. Uh, there's, they actually have, they don't, most coffee farms, the harvesters go out and they pick every bean off the tree and they're paid by volume. Uh, these harvesters are paid a straight salary. They go out and pick only the ripe beans. They have other workers that keep a, a shade tree over the coffee tree pruned just right. They grow all the coffee trees from the bean itself all the way up, and it's a fantastic farm and a great, great cup of coffee. That is an incredible uh, small world. Uh, my mother is uh, Costa Rican, and she still lives in Costa Rica. And I actually was born in Costa Rica, but I've been living in the States since I was, you know, over 20 oh. years. But what a small world. <laughs> I, I visited Costa Rica on the Pacific Coast. I worked for uh, uh, a sea turtle preservation society out of Melbourne Beach, Florida. And uh -huh. we went down there to observe their uh, nest protection activities. And yeah, it was, yeah. It was a, a beautiful country, a fantastic little country. Yeah, yeah, my mom's still down there, so I, I, I try to go down there oh, once a year or so. So, yeah, well, it's a small world. Bring me back some Hacienda La Manita coffee. <laughs> yeah, I'll, to, I'll definitely I'll have to check it out. I'll take some, I'll take some pictures down there. <laughs> do, do you speak Spanish also? Yes, I do, yeah. With a Minnesota accent? Uh, yeah, well, my father was Minnesotan, my mother was Costa Rican, so he spoke to me in English, she spoke to me in Spanish, so I kind of got lucky. I never really had to learn both languages. <laughs> so I speak English with a Minnesotan accent and Spanish with a Costa Rican. <laughs> oh, great. All right, thanks a lot, Wayne. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you later, and uh, thanks for being on the show. Okay, you take care now. Thank you for listening to this episode of Meet the Thriller Author. I'd like to ask you to please uh, rate and review this uh, podcast over on iTunes. It only takes a few seconds, and it really helps me get the word out about the podcast. I would really appreciate that. And you can visit my website at thrillingreads.com forward slash podcast. If you haven't subscribed yet, you can do so from there. Uh, you can do it on iTunes. You can do it with Stitcher. You can do it on Android. The RSS feed is there, so I make it very easy for you to subscribe to this uh, podcast. And you can also join my mailing list uh, from the website. And I've actually been uh, getting some pretty cool offers uh, for listeners. So if you want to uh, get a great deal on a thrilling read, you can uh, join the mailing list over at thrillingreads.com forward slash podcast. And uh, you'll get a, I'll let you know about these uh, great offers that I've been receiving uh, that I can pass on to you. And uh, please visit my website, my author website over at alanpeterson.com. And you can download my uh, 
best-selling thriller, The Asset, for free from there. Thank you very much, and until next time.